Good evening. Good evening. What a beautiful hymn. When I think about that hymn, I think that's the message of this year's conference. Hast thou heard him, seen him, known him? And that singular question of greatest importance, is not thine a captured heart? And it later on talks about the unveiling of his heart. That's what we're after. May the Lord in his mercy, his deep and great mercy, show us things we've never seen. May the Lord refresh vision in us that have walked with him many, many years. May the Lord... For those of you that are new and young, there's a lot in here younger than I am. May you see the Lord in such a way that you too will say, I am captured and I am caught. This is the burden for the conference and this is my task tonight if the Lord would enable us to sort of explain the burden. Now, I'm looking forward to hearing Dana and Lucio and David and hearing what those brothers have to say. I think we'll hear much. And I'm hoping at the end of it, every one of us is caught. And every one of us knows we're kept by the grace of God. From the youngest to the oldest, may the Lord quicken us and do something marvelous. Now... I want to read just the two verses that are on the handbook. These are our theme verses for this week. Acts 20, verse 7. This is actually from the American Standard Version. For I, this is Paul. And he said, For I shrank not from declaring unto you the whole counsel of God. That's quite a statement. And then... A second declaration of his in Acts 26, verse 19, to King Agrippa, when he was on trial, he said, Whereupon King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I think these verses are of great significance. And may the Lord, as our brothers share this week, and as we fellowship together in fellowship groups, and as we pray together, and as we encourage one another to press on in the Lord, have that same sense of his glory in the depth of these things and see things as we should. Well, uh, I do want to say welcome. Like Jerry, I do want to say welcome. This is the conference we thought would never happen. I don't know if you know that. In 2022, we thought the conferences were over. We really did. When Longwood told us, well, we're not doing residential conferences anymore. We thought it was it. And then we went and uh, began to seek the Lord. And we said, Lord, we're quite fine with that. We're okay with that. If that's what you want, we're okay with that. And it seemed every door was closed. And then miraculously, this door opened. I'll never forget that day it happened. To come to William and Mary was something we'd never dreamed of or even expected. This is a marvelous place. And to be able to gather like this in his name, how wonderful it is again. We made a call to this place. And I remember when we made that call, we told the lady, we weren't going to hold back, by the way. We were going to tell her we wanted to have a Christian family conference and see if they were open to it. Now, in this world, you know, that's risky. And this is considered such a prestigious place. We didn't know how they would respond. I left a message. They called back in 15 minutes, and this delightful, later to discover, sister in the Lord called me and told me, sure, we could have a family conference, a Christian family conference. And that was the beginning. We're so grateful. 
We're so grateful. He has opened the door that no man can shut. When you think of what he said to the Church of Philadelphia in Revelations, well, you know, this is uh, over 51 years. Some of you I'm looking at, including one speaking, has been here every one of those years. Some of us have grown up here. Linda and I were married at one of these conferences. And I know she'll shoot me, but today, the 30th, is our 50th anniversary. I blame, it, I blame it on Brother Kong. We went to Brother Kong after a youth conference at Wabana in Maryland. And I went to Brother Kong with Linda. Of course, I'd already proposed to her. So she wondered, why were we going? We were going to ask him if he thought it was a good idea that we get married. And we went up there, and Mary made Peking duck. And it was a special occasion to be with Stephen and Mary in Washington, D.C. And I finally got up courage to ask the question, Brother Kong, do you think we ought to get married? He said, yes, at the conference. I'll never forget. It was only six weeks away. I thought, he doesn't understand American customs. How can we get a wedding together in six weeks? But it was lovely. I had the cheapest wedding known to man, but it was lovely. It was with the saints. It was in this kind of fellowship. And 51 years later, we're here to say, this is our testimony. We are caught. We are kept by the heavenly vision. We have seen something that is deep in the Lord's heart. It is something that has arrested us and changed us and redirected our lives. And this is the most precious place to be, even on my anniversary. Well, when we came together to consider the burden for this conference with 19 assemblies, Two sisters. Don't think everything comes from the brothers. A lot of times we confuse it. But two sisters said in our planning session with 19 assemblies, what about caught and kept? And you know, it struck a chord with us. We thought, this seems like the right thing. We knew the Lord's heart in these 51 years for these conferences has been the heavenly vision. We knew the Lord's heart has been the eternal purpose of God. As a matter of fact, when we went to Brother Kong in 2022 and said, Brother Kong, do you think we ought to stop having the conferences? I want to tell you, it was no polite gesture on his part. He rebuked us soundly. We did it because we thought he couldn't be here and couldn't speak, and maybe it was time to conclude. And he made it very clear. This is about no single man. This is about no one's ministry. This is about the Lord Jesus and his eternal purpose and everything that is involved with that. So that, we were corrected. We're thankful for that correction so here we are, these sisters had recommended that we consider this thought of caught and kept by the heavenly, caught and kept. And then later as we prayed about it, this thought came to us by the heavenly vision. Something has to catch you. Something has to keep you. There's something in life that controls every human being. You're caught by this world. You're caught by the riches of this world. You're caught by the deception of this world. Or you're caught by something far grander that will never end. There's only two options. And we thought this was just the burden we need. Now, I don't know what you thought of it. I didn't know if you thought you, we would bring you down to Williamsburg and lock you up and never let you go. And this is how we build a church in Richmond. When I was in the fourth grade, I remember we used to come to Williamsburg, Colonial Williamsburg, for field trips. I think it was part of our patriotic duty. I don't know if they do that anymore. 
When I was in the fourth grade, I came down here and I went to the town square and they had these wooden stocks where they stuck the prisoner's head, the captive's head through and the captive's hands through. And, and you, you know, you, you get the picture. And some of my buddies, fourth grade, put me in the stocks and I didn't think I would ever be free. And they tell me the appropriate thing to do is to pillory you with rotten tomatoes and eggs. And then you teach the criminal a lesson. Well, that's not what we were thinking at all. We were thinking we need to see something of the Lord so grand, so powerful, it would change the direction of our life. We would see something so beautiful in the Lord Jesus, we would be captivated by his beauty. We would see something so gracious in his inclusion of us as the people of God into all of his wealth and glory that we would be kept forever. This is the explanation of our time together. This conference, this year, is about something far greater than us. It's about something that's deep in his heart. It's about something that has been eternal. It's about something that is forever. And if you see it, you'll never be the same. We are the testimony of that. We didn't just like the food. That's not the reason we came back for 51 years. We liked what we saw. We liked what we heard. We liked what we tasted. And we were changed forever. Well, I hope maybe that explains some of the things. I want to look at things fairly simple tonight. As we look at these two verses and as we look at this overall theme, I want to look at two Vital declarations. We've read those two vital declarations. They were declarations of the Apostle Paul, but they're of supreme importance in understanding the heart of God. They're of supreme importance in what it means to be caught and kept by the heavenly vision. We're going to look at two prominent men. Just look at Peter and Paul for a moment. You've already heard from Jerry. He mentioned the children are looking at Peter this week. Peter, caught and kept by the heavenly vision. We'll consider a few things about these two men. And finally, two final encouragements. I think there's encouragement in this that should, should uh, cause you to fall down and worship our King. What has been prepared for us, no one can imagine. It hasn't entered into the heart of man. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things he has prepared for those that love him. Oh, brothers and sisters, may the Lord help us in a real way as we take this burden up tonight. First of all, these two vital declarations. These two verses are really the last, the last nine chapters of the book of Acts. This is what you see. If you're going to understand the last nine chapters of the book of Acts, you ought to read them as a whole. And you ought to understand how much these declarations that the Apostle Paul control that whole theme in those nine chapters. That's the way you understand what's in the heart of God. Uh, you know, under, if you read it very carefully, I don't want to give you too much history, maybe just a taste. Paul had left Ephesus. I think maybe you know that after the tumult in Ephesus over the temple, uh, you know, the temple of their goddess. And then he... He set his face towards Jerusalem. Now, that's significant to me because you remember the Lord Jesus also set his face like flint towards Jerusalem. And he was determined to go to Jerusalem. But before he went to Jerusalem, he had one thing on his heart. He wanted 
to meet again with the Ephesian elders and share again with them what he had shared with them all those years. I don't know if you know it, but the Apostle Paul was with the church in Ephesus more than any other church. It says in chapter 20 of, of, uh, of Acts that I was with you three years in tears, sharing with you. The Apostle Paul spent more time in Ephesus than any other place. I can think a little bit of a comparison. You remember Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. Paul said to the Corinthian church, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Eighteen months he was with the church in Corinth. But three years he was with Ephesus. And what he shared in this first declaration was what he had done in Ephesus all those years. I have not shrunk from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Now think about that. Think of the difference for a moment between Corinth and Ephesus. In Corinth, he could only share about Jesus Christ and him crucified. How limited that vision was. But when it came to Ephesus, he said something of astounding importance. He said, I have shared with you not just the counsel of God, but the whole counsel of God. That's quite a statement. I think you would agree that's quite a statement to make. He didn't just share part of what was in God's heart. He shared all of what was in his heart. And after he left Macedonia and, and eventually came over to Troas and the breaking of the bread, and you remember that story about Eutychus falling out the window dead? Oh, that's not, I'm not preparing you that I'm going to speak to midnight, by the way. But then it was in his heart to meet with those elders and he went over to Mytilene, and then he went, went over to Miletus, and he called them out. And he, when he came to them, he said, there's one thing I want you to know. I have not shrunk from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. How wonderful what they heard. Brothers and sisters, when I think about what we've been privileged to hear these 51 years, not just in the Christian Family Conference, we've been to many wonderful conferences all over this country, heard many wonderful brothers share things of profound significance, and those things have been the things that have caught us and kept us all these years. Well, there he made that monumental statement. I don't know, uh, brothers and sisters, what you think of that, but you cannot understand Paul is a man. You cannot understand Paul's ministry. You cannot understand what made the apostle, what controlled the apostle, unless you have some understanding of the whole counsel of God, how important it is, how we need to see what it is. Now, you know this was his farewell message. I don't know how many of you remember those chapters very well. We don't have time to read them, but this was his farewell message. He said he was going to Jerusalem, and he knew bonds awaited him, and he said to them, he said, you will never see my face again. You read the end of chapter 20, they fell on his neck and wept. And it says, because he had said, you will never see my face again. What he had shared with them was so precious, so real, so life-changing, so powerful, that they could never forget it. And he wanted one last opportunity to be with them before he went to Jerusalem to share that whole council. 
How wonderful. And you know, it goes on. He went there, and then he, the Jews had a plot, you know, to kill him. I, I'm going to make this a very short history lesson because I want to talk about the declaration, not the history. But when he went, he found out the Jews were plotting to kill him. And he was saved by the grace of God from a, by a Roman garrison. And he was put in prison for two years. He was a captive, put in prison for two years. And then still they tried to kill him. And he knew of the plot. And he confessed to the Roman garrison that he was a Roman. And he appealed to Caesar. And that's the only reason he went to prison in Rome. You know, at the end of those trials, it's a wonderful story. At the end of those trials, after Festus and Felix and Agrippa had heard everything that was said about the Apostle Paul and everything they wanted to do to the Apostle Paul, their conclusion is he, was, he should be free. He's done nothing wrong, just like the Lord Jesus. But he had appealed to Caesar. And once you appeal to Caesar, I'm not a Roman citizen, by the way. I don't understand the power of this. But once he had appealed to Caesar, those underlings of Caesar made sure he was going to see Caesar. But it was in that time of trial with King Agrippa, he made that second powerful declaration. With King Agrippa, he said... Whereupon, King Agrippa, I have not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. How wonderful. That was his testimony at the end. Brothers and sisters, I want to know, will that be our testimony at the end of our life? Can we say like the Apostle Paul, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision? I hope we can. And you know what happened when he went to Rome and he was imprisoned for his first imprisonment in Rome. He did an extraordinary thing. His greatest work might have been done. He wrote the four prison letters. Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, Philippians. And now this just wasn't Something he had shared of the whole counsel of God with the Ephesians for three years. This letter of Ephesians opened to us the whole counsel of God. The fullness of it. I don't know if you know this, but the Ephesian letter is a circular letter. The original manuscripts, the ones they have, it's blank to the church at. And there's no personal greetings in there. There's nothing that says it. This was a, a word to all of us. And the Apostle Paul, as a captive of Christ, in that Roman prison, wrote, it, wrote the greatest letter that was ever written, Ephesians. And in that letter of Ephesians, he shared with us the whole counsel of God and the heavenly vision. How wonderful. It couldn't get any more wonderful. There are people that have said extraordinary things about the book of Ephesians. They said it's Paul's third heaven epistle. They've said it's the Alps of the New Testament. They have said there's this old fellow, J. Vernon McGee. Now he has even a deeper southern accent than I have. He has a longer southern drawl than I have. I don't know if any of you remember back to the Bible. I remember Jerry's raising, he's an old codger. He knows about back to the Bible. But when I was saved, I used to often listen to back to the Bible. And old J. Vernon McGee is that guy that said of the book of Ephesians, it's the high water mark of the scripture. I've heard many brothers, including brothers here, that have stood up and said the high water mark. And none of them said, oh, J. Vernon McGee said it. What an extraordinary, extraordinary thing has been left to us. 
a circular letter for every church that we too, not just the Ephesian elders, not just those he was with three, we too could understand the whole counsel of God in the heavenly vision. I think this is marvelous. Now, when I think of this whole counsel of God, there are three things that impress me I want to share with you tonight. First of all is that descriptive adjective, the whole. Think about it. It doesn't say the counsel of God. That would be lovely. That would be powerful. But it says something more extraordinary, the whole counsel of God. Now, think about it. That means there isn't anything that's left out of it. That doesn't mean it was in part. That means what was shared to those Ephesians for three years, what he reminded those Ephesian elders, he told them for those three years, and what he wrote to all the churches of God in prison doing his greatest work as a captive of the Lord is everything included. All inclusive. The whole counsel of God includes every part and doesn't leave anything out. Yeah, I'm a fan. I don't know. This is my, probably not going to mean anything to you, but I'm fascinated by it. I am fascinated with archaeology. I don't know why, but I used to love National Geographic when it came out. I couldn't wait to look through National Geographic. And Archaeology is a science of finding fragments and trying to put together the whole. What Paul the Apostle shared under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit was the whole counsel of God. He didn't give us bits and fragments. He gave us everything. All was there. All that was in God's heart. Everything that he had for his beloved son and everything he wanted in his people. I think that's a marvelous adjective. I think of a few verses. Think of Genesis 18, verse 17, when uh, God spoke about Abraham in the Old Testament. Listen to what he said. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham the thing that I am doing? Isn't that marvelous? Think about it. Shall I hide from Abraham the thing that I am doing? This is God's heart. He wants to share what's in his heart. He doesn't want to hide what's in his heart. He doesn't want to keep what's in his heart. He wants to give it to his people in full. That's what the whole counsel means. Oh, I, I think of... Uh, John 15, 15, it gets better in the New Testament, brothers and sisters. John 15, 15 says, the Lord speaking to his own just before he gives up his life, the Lord said those precious words, those words where he even said, I have kept them, Father, when he said his prayer. Not one of them was lost except the son of perdition. But he said these words in John 15, 15. Call you no longer bondmen, for the bondman does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends, listen to this, for all things which I have heard of my father, I have made known to you. Think of what the Lord said. He said, all things which I have known of my father, I have made known to you. How beautiful. And I think of the one that lifts me to the heavens. When you look in Colossians 1, 26 and 27. Let me turn to that and read that to you. You all know this. Colossians 1, 26 and 7. Listen to this very carefully. It's so precious The mystery which has been hidden from the ages and from generations, but has now been made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what are the riches of the glory of the mystery among the nations, 
which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Can there be anything higher than that? God put his son in his people, God's son, to live through us and be our altogether complete and whole provision. This is the whole counsel. It was made known. It's no longer hidden. Often we think of mysteries as secrets, things that are to be hidden, kept secret. You might whisper it to your closest friend in a gossip session, but you wouldn't dare otherwise tell it. But mysteries, from God's point of view, are made to be made known. That's the whole counsel of God. That's why Paul said, I haven't kept back from you the whole counsel of God. How wonderful I think that is. Another thing that hits me, this encouraged me so greatly in the last years I was meditating on it, is it's the counsel of God. What Paul didn't make to us was some doctrine, some rules, some order of how we're to live the Christian of life. What he made known to us in the book of Ephesians, as he did to those elders in that church for three years, was the counsel of God. How wonderful. Now, I don't know. I don't want to turn you into Greek scholars because I don't think any of us are Greek scholars. I'd like to meet you if you are. But sometimes I think that can be a distraction. Uh, you know, we get so hung up in the original word. But sometimes it's important to understand that the original word means far more than the word in our language. It's certainly the case here in council. The word, if you look it up, means purpose. It means counsel. It means will. The word, if you look it up, it means uh, uh, with the Greek word, let me tell you, I like it. It sounds good to me. It almost sounds like hallelujah. The word is boule. Now, I don't know. Can you remember that? Remember, if you forget everything I said about the whole council in a heavenly vision, remember boule because it's wonderfully encouraging. What that literally means in the original Greek is a properly resolved plan used particularly for the immutable plan of God. Now, do you know what immutable means? Somebody in this room has to know what immutable means. Unchanging. Isn't that encouraging? You know, God doesn't all of a sudden see the church and see it's in such horrible shape that he's going to go for plan B and give up. His plans, his counsel, his purpose, his will is immutable. It will never change. How glorious that is when you think about it. It goes on. It means more than that. It means this plan of God which purposely arranges all physical circumstances. Did you know that? Isn't that lovely? When we're full of anxiety and wondering what will happen to us next, we can trust in the whole counsel of God that arranges, purposely arranges, all physical circumstances. And here's another part of it, it means. It's so encouraging to me. Guaranteeing. Now, you know, I was in a business for 50 years as a structural engineer, and I was told by my lawyers, don't you guarantee anything. <laughs> That's it. Don't you guarantee anything. But God is bold enough to guarantee the whole counsel of God. It can never fail. How marvelous how encouraging. And he went on to say, this, by the way, is from the HELPS word studies. I don't know if any of you use that, but this is what it's from. Guaranteeing every scene of life 
also works according to his eternal purpose. Isn't that beautiful? I hope if you forget everything I said, at least that encourages you. Boule! Can you remember it? What it means is God is in charge. When we look at the world today, when we look at things today, when we look at the chaos, when we look at the lawlessness, when we look at this sin-ridden and sick world, I think we can't, we, we can't believe this. Can it be true that God is in control of everything? The whole counsel of God simply means God is in control of everything. You know, I hate to tell you, but Vladimir Putin is not in control. Xi Jinping is not in control. Joe Biden, in case you re miss recent TV, is not in control. <laughs> Donald Trump won't be in control if anything happens. Only one is in control, arranging all the circumstances of history. Another reference said about Boule. It said, it is more than God's immutable plan of physical circumstances. It also includes the Lord's purpose in them. And hence, arranging all the physical scenes of history before creation. Isn't that marvelous? This is what the whole counsel of God is. This is what we can be encouraged about, how marvelous it is that everything was arranged. Let me read to you in case you think I've gone off the deep end already, and some of you have, I know. Let me read to you uh, from Ephesians 1, 4, verse 6, and tell me if this is not boule. 4. According as he has chosen us in him before the world's foundation, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, having marked us out beforehand for adoption through Jesus Christ to himself, according to his good, the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, whereupon he has taken us into favor in the beloved. This is the encouragement that I offer you tonight about the whole counsel of God. Think about it. There's another phrase in the book of Acts which shows us that this counsel can never fail. It's in Acts 2, verse 23 when Peter stood up at the day of Pentecost and he was talking about the Lord's death and he said a particular thing that strikes me. He said, him, speaking of the Lord, given up by the determinate counsel. Isn't that beautiful? It's determined. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to lose sleep about it. You don't have to be anxious about it. You don't have to be in despair about it. It's determinate. It will happen. This is what boule means. I think this is vast encouragement. And when we think of our theme, we ought to be looking how high it is, how grand it is, how marvelous it is, how full it is. And we should thank God that these things have been made known to us. You know, I think of God being in control. I think of Nebuchadnezzar. You remember his dream. By the way, the Lord raised up Nebuchadnezzar. You know that. To discipline his wayward children and get them over their fascination with idols once for all and turn back to the living God. But you remember, Nebuchadnezzar had this great dream of a tree. A grand tree, a tree, it says, that reached to the heavens. Of course, that tree was about Nebuchadnezzar. That's what he thought of himself, a tree that reaches to the heavens. All the cattle could come under the shade of that enormous tree. The birds of the air, all of them could flock 
into that enormous, powerful tree that rises to the heavens. And he was puzzled by the dream, and he called all the wise men from Babylon to come in and tell him what it meant. Not a single one got it right. But then Daniel did in fear and trembling. And what that dream meant, it was said four times. He said, this great tree shall be reduced to a stump. And he said, so that men might know the heavens do rule. So that we may know that God raises up who he will. And God puts down who he will. And God, in his wisdom, puts the basis of men in those places. Brothers and sisters, the simple story of Nebuchadnezzar and his humiliation when he ate grass like an ox was Daniel said to him, Four times the heavens do rule. That's the whole counsel of God. How beautiful. Well, the third thing I think about when I think about the whole counsel of God is is this matter of it's an inclusive vision. You know, when you read the book of Ephesians, you begin to understand Paul's wisdom in the mystery. He showed clearly that this vision, this purpose of God, this eternal purpose, the only place that phrase is used in chapter 3, he saw clearly uh, these things, that it was an inclusive vision. When you read chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, listen to this. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself for the administration of the fullness of times, to head up or sum up all things in Christ, the things in the heavens and the things upon the earth, in him, in whom we have also obtained an inheritance being marked out beforehand according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Isn't that beautiful? Can it be any clearer? You know what this is about? The whole counsel of God is all about Christ. It's all about Christ. Have you seen him? Have you heard him? Have you known him? Is not thine a captured heart? When you see him, everything changes. I always explain that God is son-centric. You know what that means? That means everything is centered in his son. It says here, he's going to sum up all things in Christ. That's the whole plan of God. The Son means everything to him. The Son is first. The Son is the centerpiece of everything. You know, when I grew up, and I don't know if you still do it, we used to have in our dining room table that we rarely ate at, once in a blue moon, as we say in the South, we'd eat at it on Thanksgiving or Christmas. We had a centerpiece right in the middle of the table. And it sat there all year, just that centerpiece. No food done on the table, just the centerpiece. But that's how God's vision is of his son. He's the centerpiece. Everything is centered in his son. I'll never forget when I was a young believer and I heard Brother Sparks say that Christ is the center and the circumference of the circle. That's everything. I understand a little bit about circles. You know, I understand a little bit about numbers and things like that. That's what I did for so long. But he's not only the center. He's the circumference. And he's everything in between. And he is the very center of the plan of God. Unless we see that, we'll never understand. That's part one of this inclusive 
vision. There's the incomparable Christ. What can you compare him to? You remember that story of Peter? We'll talk about Peter's falls a little later. But you remember that story of Peter at the Mount of Transfiguration when Moses and Elias appeared with the Lord and the Lord was transfigured before him. You remember the glory of that moment. Oh, Peter was in his glory. As a Jew, what more could you ask as a Jew? You had Moses, the law. You had Elias, the great prophet who called down fire from heaven. Not only had it, you had the Messiah. It was complete. I can't blame Peter for getting excited. I get excited about it, and I'm not a Jew. But even he said, oh, Lord. You remember he said, oh, Lord, it's good that we're here. Let us build three tabernacles. One for you. Of course, he had to say that first. One for Moses. One for Elias. And God couldn't stand it. He couldn't stand it. God rent the heavens. He rent the heavens. How can you pair, compare the incomparable Christ to anyone else? It's impossible. Peter's fault, which he had many, was comparing Christ to other things. Well, I think you understand. I think the problem with us believers, I hope you don't get offended, I'm including myself, is we are the center of the universe. We think it's all about our blessings, our peace, our joy, our gift, our ministry. We're the focus of everything. We're in the foreground, and Christ somehow is in the background for everything we need. Oh, how wrong that is. That's the way we think of ourselves. All for me. Now, Jerry, you're from the center of the universe. I think I've told that story before. Jerry's from Ashland, Virginia. 7,500 people, such a small place, just north of Richmond. And they were brilliant in their marketing campaign. You go look at their website. It says, Ashland, Virginia, the center of the universe. 7,500 people, not New York, the center of the universe, not Paris, the center of the universe, Ashland, Virginia, the center of the universe. How did you folks come up with that? <laughs> and then you go to Ashland, they have center street. You can walk down center street in the center of the universe. They even have a center of the universe brewing company. I know I'm not supposed to mention alcoholic beverages at this conference. We think we're the center of the universe. And like Ashland, we're so small. We're so tiny. We're almost insignificant. And there's the incomparable Christ. If you see him, everything changes. Your life is spoiled. You'll never be the same. That's what happened to Paul on the Damascus Road when he saw the heavenly vision. That's what happened to Peter when he saw the Christ, the son of the living God. It's Caesarea Philippi. Oh, dear brothers and sisters, that's part one. And in part two of the heavenly vision, let me read to you in chapter 3, 9 through 11. It says, And to enlighten all with the knowledge of what is the administration of the mystery hidden throughout the ages in God who has created all things in order that now to the principalities and authorities in the heavenlies might be made known through the assembly, the church, the all various wisdom of God according to the purpose of the ages which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't this marvelous? This is part two of a two-part inclusive vision. He included us. 
you can understand, I hope you understand, maybe I'm not making it very clear, you can understand the incomparable Christ. He's the center of the universe. But can you understand that God in his mercy and his grace his purpose and his whole counsel has determined to include you and me with Christ? How marvelous that the all, listen to this, you need to be very careful that now, not sometime later in eternity, that now might be made known the all various wisdom of God in the church. How beautiful. This is the two-part vision, I think, that is so tremendous. This is the one time the Bible says the eternal purpose of God. You're wondering what it is? It's Christ and his church. You're wondering how God would do that? He needs nothing. Think about it. Why would God include his creation into that which is the center of the universe? There's only one explanation for it. If you look in verse 9, and if you have the King James Version, now I can always trust King James Jerry. He always has his King James sword ready to pull out on any given moment to swat you down with the word of God. And it says, I love this. I love this in the King James Version. There's a phrase that explains why he would include us. There's this little phrase. We often read over it. I wonder how many times you remember it. The fellowship of the mystery. Isn't that beautiful? That was the whole reason he included us in this grand purpose for fellowship. The fellowship of the mystery. You know, it almost made me want to put away my Darby, Jerry, and go back to the old King James. I might have to borrow one from you. But I, I was so lost in reading Darby. It says the administration of the mystery. I thought, what does that mean? But if you look in the original Greek, the word is Kononia, it's fellowship. There's no question what it is. What was in God's heart was that we would be joined to him in eternal fellowship. Can you imagine? You remember when Paul wrote to that Corinthian church in the opening part of 1 Corinthians in Verse 9, he said, God is faithful by whom you have been called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the whole explanation of the divine will, of the heavenly vision, of the whole counsel of God, of the eternal purpose. Fellowship. You have been invited. You have been included as, I, I hate to say an equal part, but as a vast part in this fellowship. So much so that when you study the book of Ephesians carefully, you see we are the body of Christ. He chooses at the body of Christ, the fullness of him that fills all in all, that we could be that thing, that vessel, uh, uh, that uh, group of believers, that church, that assembly through which he eternally expresses himself. He goes on to say something more grand. He says, you are the building of God being built together, a holy habitation for God in the Spirit. Isn't that wonderful? The eternal home of God. You come to the end of Revelations and it says, God tabernacles with man. We are his eternal home. But even more grand, almost unbelievable if it wasn't recorded is we are the bride of Christ. Can you imagine? We are his eternal companion. That God 
would think of such thing? Why would he think of it? How did he think of it? The fellowship of the mystery. Well, I think you're getting what I'm talking about. At least I hope so. But I need to finish. There are two prominent men. There are two prominent men in the New Testament. There's Paul, the Apostle Paul, and there's the Apostle Peter. And the one thing I am convinced of is these two men were above everything else, everything you can tell about them. They were men of vision. How important vision is. How important vision is. If we don't see the necessity of vision, how we will be lost, walking our own path, making ourselves the center of the universe. Listen to what Brother Kong said at that first conference at Harvey Cedars. I didn't realize, even though I was there, that was his first message ever at Harvey Cedars was the heavenly vision. I had forgotten. I've read both of those messages again and poured over them. And Brother Kong said, the wisest man in the world, Solomon wrote, without vision, the people perish. He went on, that's by the way, Proverbs 29, verse 18. He went on to say, heavenly vision is not optional. It is mandatory. I didn't remember that. All these years I forgot it. But when I read it, I knew this was the heart of God. As God's people... We must, this is what he said, we must have this heavenly vision that satisfies God's own heart. And then he said something else. And only that vision can satisfy our hearts. Isn't that beautiful? Well, look at these two men for a moment. Paul, it's hard to estimate his prominence when you look at the New Testament. After all, Paul the Apostle wrote almost half the books of the New Testament. There were other apostles. But he wrote 13 that we know of, of the 27 books of the New Testament. Now, my math is the only thing I usually keep straight. And 13 27 is almost half. And some of you, if you like our brother Jerry, I put on poor Jerry tonight so much, that believes he wrote the book of Hebrews, and by the way, he's in very good company. He would write over half the New Testament. Think of it. We wouldn't have a Bible, a New Testament at least, without the Apostle Paul. All the doctrine, all of our understanding of the churches, all of our understanding of what God did, he did through this man, this prominent man, this apostle to the nations, this apostle to the Gentiles, this apostle to the church. What a prominent person he was. And yet, I think of Paul before the heavenly vision. You think of him. He was a fire-breathing dragon. I don't know if you realize. He was the enemy of God. He was Paul, the great persecutor. He got letters to go and seek out from the Jews, the, those people of the way, women and men, and see to it that they were imprisoned and or put to death. And he used his own testimony and said it again. He ravaged the church. He was brutal. He was heartless. He was downright mean if you want me to tone it down. And you know, I always don't think so clearly. I thought, if I were God, you're grateful I'm not. I would think an appropriate punishment would be, would be like King Herod in Acts 12, eating through with worms. 
And then I think of what the Lord said to the sons of thunder. You don't know what spirit you are of. Brothers and sisters, this enemy of God, God decided this great persecutor would become his greatest component and proponent. Do you understand that? What are the ways of God, the miraculous ways of God, that he would save this man, his enemy, and he would make him his greatest spokesman? I can hardly take that in. It's so marvelous. Do you know that we're all enemies of God? It says in Romans 5, 10, we being enemies are saved by the power of his life. Thank God he doesn't dispose of all of his enemies. In this case, he made his chief enemy on earth in that time, in the first century, his main spokesman. I think that's marvelous. I don't know any other way to explain it, but think this marvelous. Well, I think when we see how greatly this man was used, it was because he saw something. It was because what he saw caught him. It was because at the end, in all that he went through, incredible sufferings, he knew this was the one who kept him. Have you ever read 2 Corinthians 6 and 2 Corinthians 7 and read what appeared to me to be exhaustive lists of perils and sufferings? And you wonder why. You remember when he was called on the Damascus Road and what was told Ananias, poor little Ananias, had to go to this fire-breathing dragon and he wanted assurance from God that it was okay to go to this fire-breathing dragon. And the Lord said the strangest thing. He said, he is an elect vessel to me. And I will use him before kings and nations, and the children of Israel, and I will show him how much he will suffer for my namesake. What an introduction to Christianity. Now, why did he do that? There's one reason, I think. It's the only reason I can come up with. I can't wait to hear from Dana can't wait to hear from David. I can't wait to hear from Lucio to educate me. But I think he did it to prove in a worst case scenario, I'm able to catch you. I'm able to conform you to my image. And in the end, in the worst imaginable things you could go through in life, I'm able to keep you. I think that's the story of Paul. To me, it's a clear story of Paul. And then I think of Peter. Well, you know, Peter was a rascal. You know, he always, I, said, I always say Peter had foot in mouth disease. Have you ever heard that? Maybe you don't say that, y'all. Uh, gentrified people up north. Uh, Southerners have all these uh, senseless idioms. You know, he was also a man of vision. He was the first disciple with vision. Do you remember the feeding of the 5,000? Do you remember when the Lord talked about if you're going to have eternal life, you must eat of his body? the true food, and you must drink of his blood, the true drink. And do you remember what it says after that at the end of chapter 6? Many of his disciples, doesn't say the people of the world, many of his disciples from that moment on turned back and stopped walking with him. They were so offended. And the Lord looked at his the 12, and he said, will you also go? 
Must have been a moment of great clarity, don't you think? Who was it that spoke up? Peter spoke up. And he said to the Lord, he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. That's a caught man. He might have been a very fleshly man. Many of us are. And women, by the way. He was a man that was always speaking out of turn, always saying the wrong thing. He was prominent in the Gospels, and he was prominent the whole first half of the book of Acts. Yet when I look at him, I see a flawed man. God doesn't give up on flawed men and women. We are testimonies of that. He catches them. He lays hold of them. He opens their eyes. He disciplines them. Loving, fatherly discipline. He conforms them to the very image of Christ. And in the end, when they fail, it's the story of Peter. I think it's a beautiful story. I think you all know the story of this flawed man, but he was a caught man. Think of, think of Caesarea Philippi when the Lord turned to that 12 and he said to them, who do men say that I, the son of man, is, am? That's what he said to them. And they said some good guesses, you know. Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elias, Jeremiah, so one of the prophets. Good guesses, but not comparable. And then he turned to his own and said, who do you say that I am? Who was it that spoke up? Peter blurted out, thou art the Christ the son of the living God. He saw the first part of that heavenly vision. It's all about Christ. And he saw the second part of that two-part heavenly vision. He said, and you are Peter. The Lord said, and you are Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. What a wonderful story. What a wonderful story in John 21, after he had denied the Lord, that boastful Peter, though everyone deny you, I will not, and I will die for you. Such confidence. I would say it was overconfidence. It took those three little people at that fire to say, you're one of them. You remember the little maid? You remember, oh, yeah, I've seen you before. You are one of those Galileans. I know who you are. No, I'm not. He did worse than that. He cursed the name of the Lord. If you read it in the Bible, he cursed. I'm not. I do not know him. Luke cleans it up a little bit. Look at some of the other gospels. Here's a flawed man. Yet the encouragement I have to offer you tonight is that God doesn't give up on flawed men and women. You are that flawed man. You are that flawed woman. And he wants you to see something that though you can never rise to the occasion, you can't go anywhere else. That scene in John 21, I don't know if you think about that scene. When I read it, you know, there's a miracle. Some people like the miracle. Uh, we have a brother among us in Richmond that's a fisherman, Ryan the fisherman. Man loves to fish, I'll tell you what. And they were out fishing all night and didn't catch anything. And so the Lord shows up on the shore and says, 
Put it to the other side. These were professional fishermen like Ryan. They hadn't caught anything all night. And then they caught a multitude. But then, you know what happened? John said, it is the Lord. And Peter tore off his clothing. I don't recommend you do that when you fish. And jumped in the water and swam to shore. And the Lord Jesus reeled him in. Now, who do you think was the catch? It wasn't the multitude of fish. It was Peter. He was the catch of the day. He was the one the Lord was after. He had everything made, and he said, Peter, lovest thou me more than these? And Peter was so pained, remembering his denial. He said, Lord, you know, I'm attached to you. The Lord was using the word agape. Do you love me with divine love, agape love? Peter could only say, I'm attached to you. The Lord said, Peter, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. I'm attached to you. And then the Lord did something extraordinary. He said, Peter, are you attached to me? And Peter said, Lord, you know. The pain was breaking out all over. But brothers and sisters, that's what it means to be caught. He has to be the one that catches us. He has to be the one that keeps us. He has to be the one that conforms us. He has to be the one to make us. I've explained to many people, I've told them, you can understand Peter's life with just two callings. He first called him and he said, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. You remember that? At the end, after this incident at the shore, at the Sea of Tiberias, he says to him, at the end, come, follow me. Did you notice the difference? All through Peter's life, all through his dealings, all through what he went with, all of his speaking out of turn and making mistakes, everything that he did, the Lord was making Peter. That is the heavenly vision. He who makes us, he who calls us, he who captures us, and he who in the end keeps us. Now let me end with this. Two final encouragements. When you think about these two men, they had something to say near the end of their life, shortly before their martyrdom. Both of them were martyred. You know that. They had two things to say. When Peter, when Paul wrote his last letter, you know that letter is 2 Timothy, right? You know that letter was written from the Roman prison, not the one mentioned in Acts 28, 30, and 31, which was his own hired house, where he could receive people unhinderedly. You know what this was. This was that dreadful common prison where the prisoners who were mostly Christians in Nero's day were eaten alive by rats. It was affectionately called the sepulcher. That's where he wrote this letter. And he wrote this letter of encouragement to his blessed son in the faith, Timothy. And he had one thing he wanted to say to that next generation before he went to be with the Lord. He said this in 2 Timothy 1, verse 12. For which cause also I suffer these things... But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Isn't that marvelous? 
Look at the confidence he had. In that hellhole, he was kept to the very end. He was waiting and longing to be with his Lord. And his encouragement to the next generation is he's able to keep everything you commit to him against that day. Now, I'm looking out on the next generation. Do you believe that? Do you believe this old man's great encouragement? He is able to keep you. It doesn't matter what you go through. It doesn't matter the circumstances. They can be like Paul's. I personally don't believe we'll go through all that Paul was. It was an elect vessel to show us that he can take us through anything. And then Peter, when he wrote to the church in dis, that was dispersed, let me read these verses. 1 Peter 3, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from among the dead to an incorruptible and undefiled and unfading inheritance reserved in the heavens for you. Listen to this, verse 5. Who are kept, guarded by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last. Kept, guarded. That was his word to them. His word to that dispersed and suffering church was you will be kept, guarded, an inheritance so vast you can hardly imagine it. This is what these two prominent men had to say. And regarding the whole counsel of God, it says in Proverbs 19, 20 and 21, Hear counsel and, refuse and receive instruction, that thou mayest be wise in the latter end. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. Isn't that wonderful? What an encouragement. It wasn't the only place. In Psalm 33, 11 and 12, it says, The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations, my generation, you young people, your generation, to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he has chosen for his inheritance. Lord, we commit to you these thoughts. Lord, we know we cannot explain what's unexplainable. Only you can give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the full knowledge of him. That was Paul's prayer in that letter of Ephesians, that God would grant you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the full knowledge of him. Would you, Lord, give us all this few days that divine revelation? Us seniors who've been around for a while, maybe think we know it all, we've seen it all, we've heard it all, we don't have to hurt here anymore. Refresh our vision. Capture us again if need be. And for the youngest in here that maybe have never heard, but Lord, they know, they sense you're drawing them, they're the next generation. You say, this counsel of the Lord will stand for every generation. May it stand for their generation. Capture them this week. From those in the nurseries, 
through high school, college age, young adults, everyone, that you will have a generation that seeks Jehovah. This we ask in your precious name.